right. Oh, excellent. Good morning. Really happy to see all of you here. Uh, let's talk about functional data structures uh, and Java. I cannot see much of you, but I will hope that we'll have a good session today. So a couple of words about myself. My name is Alex Shalaev, and I come from Estonia, which is a tiny country uh, just below Finland. And I work at Zero Turnaround as a developer advocate. My main responsibility as a developer advocate is to care about community of mostly Java developers. So that's how I get a chance to travel and talk to people, uh, research stuff and everything. I maintain our blog called Rebel Labs. So if you check it out, uh, I'd be happy. You can always find me on Twitter and ask any questions about either this session or anything else. Uh, I'll be happy to chat. And I'm also a leader of a virtual jog, which is a very cool uh, endeavor. We took the Java user group concept uh, and took it online. So you can participate in the sessions and learn without leaving the comfort of your own home, which is great. Uh, you are quite lucky. The Switzerland jog is an amazing, amazing community. Uh, but if you would like to join that one, would be cool as well. So Zero Turnaround is a company that does tools for Java developers. And currently, we have mostly two uh, main tools. JRebel supports uh, productivity, and it can reload changes to the Java classes at the runtime, so it saves you time. And Xrebel is a performance tool for web apps. So if you would check those out, my employer would be happy, and they will send me to talk to more people at the conferences. So. Without all, with all that formalities out of the way, let's talk about functional data structures. And the first thing that I would like to point your attention to and ask you is, what does functional mean in the context of the data structures? And at some point of time, I ran a Twitter poll, which unfortunately, due to, I don't know, timing or something, didn't, didn't gain very much popularity. But the question is, when you say functional data structures, and when you read the title of this talk, did you think that we are going to talk about uh, data structures that are correctly implemented and not dysfunctional? In a sense, they are uh, doing what they're supposed to do. A list is actually an ordered collection of items. Are they so? Who thought of functional data structures in that sense that we're going to talk about correctness? Very good. Who thought that we will talk about data structures that are not imperative? A couple of people. Excellent. Who thought that we would use this time to talk about persistent data structures? That requires a bit of knowledge about what persistent data structure is. So it's a deeper level. Mario. Great. Excellent. <laughs> uh, and all of the above is. So most of the time, if you didn't raise your hand just yet, so you have a very Mm, basically blank list, and we can talk about uh, all of the above. Uh, and I hope you would find it useful and uh, enjoy it. So we're going to talk about functional data structures in the sense that data structures that, are, uh, that have certain properties, we'll talk in a bit, and mostly they're suited for uh, software engineering and development programs when you use the functional programming as a style. And they originated from that. And functional programming is a little bit different. It's a cognitive uh, way of thinking about programs. So uh, this is the picture of Ted Newart. And he has an amazing session uh, on why functional programming matters. So he goes from the basic concepts on the functional programming and how it is a toolbox for developers. So you will get immutable values, laziness, functions as the first class citizens, partial application, recursion. All that is the base of the functional programming. So this is a toolbox. So when you develop your code and your applications, you would know that, OK, yeah, this is a good bit. I could use this particular thing very nicely for this particular problem. And we would, in this session, we would look at the data structures. We would look at the collections because, well, data is a big part of our applications. 
and their data is the universal thing that kind of is common for all the applications. So that's why in any program you will find uh, tons of collections, tons of the wrappers that hold the, the data and allow you to modify and access that in a certain way. So you would have sets and lists and trees and all that is offered by either the JDK itself for you as the part of the Java Collections framework, or you will have third-party libraries if you would like to do different trade-offs. Uh, and at some point of time, we did some research of what are the collections, what are the options, and uh, the response to that, which is actually, this is a very cool printable thing, so if you would like to check it uh, further. One thing that we found out is that data structures and the collections were studied extensively for many years, right? So if you uh, have a formal computer science education, then you probably know that like 50 years ago, even before they started talking about how amazing Agile is, uh, they talked about lists and how to reverse a linked list and, and all the different problems that people attack you at the interviews. However, if you, if you look in the internet, uh, you will find that almost all the literature claims to be language independent, and indeed you can program an efficient graph library in any language. However, it is very unfortunate that it's language independent in a sense that Henry Ford once said that programmers can use any language they want as long as this language is imperative. So it is language independent, but the platform and the way of thinking how the papers and the implementations of the data structures think of themselves is very imperative. So you write the code that modifies data in place, uh, that uses shared mutable state, and this particular implementation and way of thinking is not very suitable for functional programs. So in this session, we're going to look a little bit how to implement the data structures that you know in a functional way. What are the trade-offs? Why is it not as easy? And uh, how would you like to think about data structures in a functional way? So if we look at the whole universe of data structures that we have, and there is a hierarchy. So the first step will be the mutable data structures. And they are pretty nicely represented by the Java Collections framework in the JDK. So one of the main prime examples of that is that we have an interface called collection, and you will have the methods in that kind of like clear and add elements and everything like that. So the interface defines our API that we access the underlying collection, and it could be anything, but the Java collections framework implements mutable data structures mostly. So you will find that you have in the interface, in the API, you have methods that have void as the return type, which is a clear sign that you are dealing with the mutable thing. So if you command an object to do something and it doesn't return you anything back, it means that it does something, creates some side effects, and then operates on some mutable state, and then just comes back to you and says, oh yeah, I did this thing. So mutable data structures is what you know from the uh, JDK library. So a little bit off topic, a void return type could be seen as a little bit of a code smell. So check your API for that. Uh, probably you can restructure that to return something meaningful rather than operate on side effects. Uh, back to collections. So we have the next level in the hierarchy of the data structures. We have the immutable data structures. An immutable data structure is the one that cannot be modified after the creation. And in the Java world, you will have, you can construct those uh, immutable data structures by using the unmodifiable wrappers. So you take any collection, you call the unmodifiable list or set on that collection, and you will get a list or a set that cannot be changed at the time. So this is very interesting, and immutability is one of the core properties of the functional data structures. So a functional data structure has to be immutable. That is the definition of that. 
Uh, why being immutable and using wrappers is not enough? Because often, if you expose the argument, this other list that you used, the original collection, if it, it, if it gets it's exposed to some clients, they can still modify that in place. So, and despite you not being able to add elements to that wrapper unmodifiable list collection, still your data could change, and that will break some important invariants, and that will break some assumptions, and both functionality-wise and performance-wise, and that would be not very good. So if you use unmodifiable wrappers, be sure to not, not to expose the arguments. The next property for the uh, data structures to, to be functional is that they have to be persistent. And the persistency property is very simple. When you modify the data structure, it has to preserve the previous state. So it kind of just modifies stuff in place. We'd, we would need some sort of modification because only unmodifiable collections is kind of pointless uh, because just you can just read the data. But what we require is that when we want to do the updates, they are not destructible, destructive, and they create a new data structure, and you will have access both to the prior version of the data structure and the current one. So if you think of how you manipulate the data, most of the operations just operate on the data locally. So you do small updates sometimes to the particular parts, and the main idea for the persistent data structures to make them actually reasonably fast because if you just copy large, large chunks of memory, you would never get reasonable performance, and you would never be able to use all those things. So the main idea is that you just reuse as much structure as possible and just implement the change in a way that doesn't break that. So you are memory efficient, and you will get persistent data structures. However, persistency as a property uh, is not as easy to implement. And there, there are a couple of changes. So the functional data structures are, by definition, they are immutable and persistent. When your data structure is immutable and persistent, you can call it a functional data structure. The methods on the functional data structures are referentially transparent. That means then that whenever you call a method, you can cache the value and reuse that any time where you call that method again. If you think about that, if you cannot modify the underlying data and you always have this access to the particular version of the data structure, uh, however you call and get data from that data structure, it cannot change. So very efficiently, you can call a method once and then cache the value and uh, be quite happy with your program. It also simplifies how you reason about your data structures and collections when you, t when you are working in a concurrent environment when there are many things trying to access your data at the same time, with normal collections, with mutable state, you would have to guard the access, introduce locks, or come up with like very s smart and sometimes not very smart algorithms to kind of guard the access. With functional data structures, you know and no, nothing can change, so you are very free to just come and get the data as you like and reasoning about programs becomes, becomes much easier. So this is one of the points why you would like to use data structures, perhaps. Now, if we talk about the implementation of those, we have very strict constraints. We have two problems that first, we cannot just assign or reassign parts of the data structure at will. And then we always have to think about that when we modify the collection or the data structure, we have to be aware that we need to support multiple versions of this collection existing at the same time. So that poses some challenges to the implementation. And that is also hard to reason about when, when you think of e everyone knows how to implement the tree, right? You create a root node, and you create children, and then you swap the children at will when you need to update the tree, and, and you know that it is fast. When you think of the functional data structures, when you will have to preserve the existing tree, so you have to copy state all the way at every operation, you would be thinking that this is slow. And you would be kind of right, so uh, you would not use them in the real code. However, you should. 
So let's look at how you implement data structures, even basic, and how you reason about performance of those uh, uh, when, when you have that. So we will start with building a list. A very primitive data structure is just a ordered collection of items. And the functional list, impl functional implementation of the list is the cons list, which is the two elements. It has its head and it has its tail, where, where the tail is all the elements in the list besides the first one. And since we know that our list will be immutable, we can always specify that we know the length of this list and we have our immutable list in a very simple code. Now, this is kind of useful because we have all the private members and we don't have any API to access this as a collection. Let's build uh, a new list. So if we would like to add an element in front of the list, what we do, since we just have this const list, we create the new one. We preserve the this instance of the const list and we create a new one prepending the element as the head of the list. So now we have, if we take a list and we had like, for example, list of two and three, and we prepend one to that list, and then we take the original list prepend two, we would have a picture in memory that looks something like this. So there are multiple lists going on. Every, every element here, every square is a list in itself, and they are reusing the structure as much as possible. So, and we can prepend and build the list from, from the left. So we build longer lists from shorter lists. Is it immutable? Yes, because we do not change the structure. We just create new stuff all the time. Is it persistent? Yes, because we always preserve the access to the previous. If somebody had the reference to the old list, it never changes. So they can still use that. Can we do more operations on, on, the, on that list? For example, can we fold the list? We can because, well, we just have to iterate the, the list in itself. Uh, if you look at this code, the most important bit here is, well, you, you can iterate the list after using taking the head and then the head of the tail and then the head of the tail and so forth until you have no tail. So definitely you can use that. So can you write the code that is uh, destructive? So you can see that in this code, we have the assignment and we reassign the things. Yes, you can. It doesn't change the fact that this, the, your data structure is still immutable. You can destruct and the state locally when nobody sees that. If nobody sees that you are destructing things, you're still immutable and, and, and cool. So you can fold the list. You can also reverse the list by using those to get the combination of those two operations. So you just have to go through all the list and add the elements in the reverse order. And this is a longer operation. You have to traverse the whole the list. The same is if you want to append the element to the list. So you have to kind of appending from the left was easy and fast. You just create a new instance and you share the whole structure. Appending from the right is very tricky because you have to go through the whole list, kind of like in a list, linked list manner, and then uh, recreate the whole list. So this would be appending from the right, appending to the list is a slow operations. So now we have to talk about how slow that is. And obviously you can run some benchmarks and say, oh, this is slow and this is faster. But when you talk about data structures, you would like to talk about algorithmic complexity. So you would like to, to be able to say that, yes, this data structure, this approach is potentially as fast or comparable uh, in performance to the other ones. So when we talk about algorithm complexity, we talk about number of functions that say, oh, my operation will finish in the constant number of steps, or my operation will finish in the linear number of steps uh, from the input links or logarithmic. So if you have to traverse the whole list all the way back, you will have to use, take at least a linear amount of steps from the input size. If you have to go traverse it back and forth, and forth again, so a return trip, it's still linear. 
But if you have for every element in a list, you have to do all that again and again and again, you get quadratic, and that would be much slower. So while this is all cool and nice, it's really hard to reason in terms of proper finite complexity of accessing functional data structures. So people have come up with amortized complexity. And the main idea of the amortized complexity is that you don't judge the performance and the complexity of individual operations, but you know that you would be doing multiple things with a single data structure, and then would like to have the total expense of, of that, those operations together. So, and this, the way amortized complexity is a way to reason about uh, several data structures uh, because it's just easier that way. So, and it's also very uh, nicely mapping on the real world where you do a lot of stuff and you would care about the performance of the whole thing rather than individual things. So imagine we have a list. Imagine we have a list like this and we do a series of operations. We add new stuff from the left, we prepend stuff, and then we reverse the list. So we know how to individually think about the complexity of those operations. So prepending is just creating a new instance of the cons. So it's a O1 operation. It takes constant time. So in a sense, it doesn't matter how long your list is. You can prepend in constant time. But reversing takes, takes the linear amount of steps. So that would be slow. So can we assess how much time this whole thing will take per operation? So if we do the reverse only every n steps and operations of such, would we get a better complexity than linear? Because here we have, oh, some operations take linear time, but with this pattern, we can use the banker's method of uh, assessing uh, amortized complexity. And the banker's method is very simple. For every operation, we just don't count, we don't just count the actual com complexity of that, so constant time. But we add a little bit of credit to every operation. So every time we uh, call a cheap operation, a fast operation, we get a little bit of credit, and then later we can spend that uh, on a more expensive operations. So the n prepend operations will give us n times a uh, of the credit, so the total complexity of this thing will be big O of 2n plus n times this tiny credit, and then we just do some mathematical magic, and we take the n out of the parentheses, and then we just say divide that by n because we have n operations in the list. So we have the amortized complexity per operation of a constant plus uh, alpha, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny credit, and you can have it as tiny as you would like. So in a sense, when you have the functional list, a cons list, and you have a set of diverse operations, including creating the data and accessing that, you know that on average, in the long run, you will pay the constant cost for operations. So these operations will not be much more expensive in terms of performance than the mutable collections, because there you would still have constant time access, uh, and here per operations we have just a little bit more. So using banker's method, we will estimate other collections as well. So the problem with this obviously is, and you could ask me, but like, what if I don't call, what if I don't call the prepend and cheap operations often enough? What if I just use the expensive operations, right? And if you have the code and you expose the API, you will have people on your team or in some other department who only call expensive operations just to make your life harder. And that's, that's for sure. So with functional data structures, the best thing is that since they are immutable and persistent, and they, ha they have this referential transparency property, you can cache the results. And if you combine that with the lazy evaluation, so you would not give the answer until it's really needed, then you can have the full caching enabled. And then you would just, somebody calls an expensive operation, you give them result immediately. So the first call will be expensive, the rest will be very fast. So you would need 
a little bit different implementation, and it's not maybe as easy to implement, but there are ways to make it fast and performant. So enough about mass. Let's talk about other collections, because we are here for data structures. So we saw a list, and list is not a very, mm, it is very interesting and very basic uh, data structure, but let's talk about something more real life. So let's build a queue. And in particular, because queues are amazing, they're good for communication, you can put messages on it, you can stay in the line for public transport, uh, maybe not here, but in other countries, less uh, lucky. So how would you build a queue if you have a list? Who has an idea? Now, now we can maybe, how to build a queue. Okay, good. I can build a queue like this. So I just say that, oh, my list, is kind of, it looks like a queue, there are elements behind each other in order, and I can access it from both sa sides, from the both ends, so I just have a queue that is implemented as a list, which is our cons list, which is, which is good. So now, this could be a functional data structure, but it would be very interesting, because uh, in a list, with a list, you remember that accessing the list from one side was extremely efficient. From, from the other side, it was kind of slow. So it took the traversal of the whole list to find the end. So with the implementation like this, your performance will suffer, and you will throw it away, and you will come back to struggling with uh, using mutable collections and mutable data structures. So you have to be smarter, and you, since the only thing that you have is a list, what you do, you implement a queue by using two lists. Duh. So we will have a queue that is represented by two lists. One is the front, and the other one is the rear of the queue. And the trick will be that the front list is in order as we assume. So the head of the front list is the head of the queue. The rear of the queue will be in the reverse order. So the head of the rear is the tail of the queue, the end of the queue. If you think of a picture, if you need a picture, this is like that. And by the way, all those like, very nice diagrams come from the documentation of Java slang. We'll come to that in a moment. But yeah, I just copied them from there. Couldn't create better myself. So imagine a queue of one, two, three, four, five as elements. Then at some point of time, we can represent this queue with two lists, where the front will be a list of one, two, three, and the rear will be the list of five and four. Why is it amazing? Because we can easy, we have easy access to both ends of the queue now. Because both ends of the queue are the heads of the lists, so we can access them very efficiently. So if you would like to enqueue an element, to add an element to the end of the queue, the most normal operation, right? What you have to do, you just create a new queue, because we are immutable, so we do not destruct the old var values. So you create a new queue, and you just prepend the element to the rear list. So now the new queue will be the same front and the same rear with one element added. You can see that, that this operation definitely takes, what does it take? A constant number of steps. We don't do any traversal, you just create a new object, and this should be pretty fast. So if you want to tail a queue, which is a very important operation, so you take all the queue except the first element, you just use the operations on the lists again. Since you don't need, you, you need everything besides the first element, you just drop it and create a new queue out of that. Also, you can see that there is no traversal going on, so it's very important and, uh, to be efficient. So this is how you tail. If you want to implement the peak operation, just to look at the things, you can also do that very efficiently. You have the data in there. You just access the queue from one side. You get the head, and you, you see the val values there. And the code, if you, if you think of the code, the code is pretty trivial, right? Nothing that they have shown on the slides is just actually like rocket science or anything more than three lines of code. So if you assume the right paradigm, then implementing the code in a functional way could be quite easy as well. 
Now, unfortunately, not everything is uh, as shiny and nice and, and, and green and uh, unicorny. If you have operations that actually have to modify the data structure, so example, for example, you want to dequeue an element, you want to take the head and remove that from the queue, so you can potentially access and consume the whole queue of elements one by one. So if you just peek at the head and then you peek at the head again, your queue doesn't change, so you will not get to the processing of all the elements, which would be a shame. So you will need destructive operations. Since we have to be persistent and we cannot change the state, our destructive operations will return uh, a tuple of values. So for example, here, if we have a queue of integers and we call the dequeue method, the result would be a pair of elements. One will be the result, the head element, the integer, and the second one will be the state of the queue after dequeuing an element. Why is this important? because it violates the contract of the Java collections framework for, for, for the collections. So in the queue, if you look at the, mm, the queue in the Java collections framework, DQ doesn't return you a pair. It will just return you the head element, and you can reuse the reference to the queue from the old code because it changes stuff in place. So you cannot use functional data structure as a drop-in replacement most of the time. Some of the time you can, but if you are considering that, oh my god, I'm sold, I would like to just replace all my collections with functional now, just to be so much better at reasoning about concurrent access, this is not happening. So you will have to change stuff. But however, with this approach, you know that the original queue is not affected, and you can definitely do that. So the actual DQ would look like that, so you just return uh, a pair of the head element, of the queue and the tail, which is the rest of the queue. How is that good? How, is, how we can do that? And uh, if our collection is empty, we use math to ensure that there are invariants. So we would like our queue to be, in a sense, when our front is empty, we should know that the rear is also empty. Because if we just consume the element from the front, then at some point of time, we have to start consuming the elements in the rear from the back, because it's a reverse list. So we need to ensure the invariant. How do we ensure invariants with data structures? We carefully write the code that mutates those. The benefit of functional collections, we don't mutate them, right? So we only change them in the constructors when we create stuff. So the only place where you have to think about the logic of maintaining the invariants is the constructors. So when you create the queue, if the front list that you give is empty, you just reverse the rear and put it at the front and set the rear for empty. So this is how you maintain the invariant that when your front is empty, the rear is also empty. So when your collection is empty, your queue is empty. It just when you can only change the, check the front. However, you can notice that there is the reverse operation, which is an expensive one. So now we have to reason about the performance of this queue again. However, you will find quickly that the implementation of a queue like that achieves the amortized cost of a constant operation, so O1. And you can prove that, so a sketch of a proof will be like this. So imagine you have a queue where you have the M elements in the front and M elements in the rear. So the only time when you will need to call the reverse operation when the front is empty. So you would have to call DQ at least M times to achieve the state where the front is empty and the rear has to be reversed. So, and as we saw using the banker methods, uh, we can estimate that if we call the DQ M times, and then we do a linear number of operations for the reversal, the amortized cost will be O1. So that will be quite fast. How awesome is that? You can use math to reason about performance of your algorithm and data structures, uh, which is, I think it's quite cool. So let's go further. How to build a map? Because maps are everywhere. JavaScript objects are maps. Uh, Java objects are not exactly maps, but you can think of them as maps. You have a map collection. You tie together keys and values 
all the time. So how to build a map when you have a list and a queue? Who has an idea? Mario? <laughs> so it's actually it's quite intricate. And you cannot just build a map by combining lists and queues, because you have to have a relationship between keys and values. However, have no fear. For the functional data structures, you have a map implementation, and actually several of them. And they come with very nice properties. What, you would, what I would like you to know about the functional data, map, uh, functional data structure map is that it's typically is based on the hash array mapped tree, uh, tree as in like suffix tree, which is the T-R-I-E tree. Uh, and it basically what it does, it looks like this. So you have a key, and you separate that key into the chunks. And the key is actually the path from the root node to the leaf node, where you store the value. So if you see on the map, the green part of the key represents the node here. So the next couple of bits in the key are determining which path you take down the, this hash array map tree. And then you traverse your key to, 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 to by those sections, and you find the way to some leaf node, and that will be your value. So this is how you represent maps most of the time in a functional way. So you can access that. Your access time will be quite fast because there are only so many bits in the key. Imagine if you have, if you have a binary tree where your keys are integers, which are 32-bit numbers. right? If you have the branching factor of 2, so every time you can either go, when you see 0, you go left, see 1, go right, you will have the tree with branching factor 2 and the depths of 32 because you have only 32 bits in the key. So your access time will be 032, something which is still 01. 32 is kind of like a constant for some uh, reasonably large values for the constants. So updating this map will go exactly as we do with all the other stuff. So when you have to change things or add things, you just try to reuse as much structure as, as you can and just add the, the pieces that are missing. So we just recreate a single branch there, and then we reuse all the structure before that. And we just reference that, the previous data structure. Why we can do that? Because we know that the previous data structure is immutable, and it will never change. Why is it also cool? Because we only reference the data structures that go below the root level. So we know that if nobody is pointing to the old version anymore, it can be safely garbage collected. So we are working with the platform nicely. We are simplifying our reasoning, and we can do a map like this. I will not provide an actual implementation of the map because it doesn't fit on a slide. So that is quite complex, but you are definitely welcome to just go see that. Uh, let's go further. Let's talk about trees again. And this would be the last uh, data structure that I want to talk about today. Normal trees, we all see that, but I would like to talk about the zipper. Zipper it is a da the functional data structure which allows you traversal and nice representation of trees with updating them locally. So if you think about how we think of a tree, and this is an example of a red-black tree, it's just a structure where we have root nodes and children. And you traverse that from the top, and then you do something. And when you have to change the structure, you will have to recreate the whole branch, because well, otherwise you break the existence, existing data structures. So now, where zipper comes in, it's, it, a zipper aggregates the data structure and the traversal of that. And it changes the perspective how you see that. So if you look at the tree through zipper, Imagine that you are actually somewhere in the node inside the tree, and that it actually has it has pointers not just to children, but to the pointer to the parent as well. So now every time you, you traverse the tree, you will create a new node and it will point to the neighboring elements. So you re a zipper represents a location in a data structure. And it is fairly useful. The coolest bit about that is that when you need to change the value locally, you can just do that and create a new zipper pointing to all the neighbors as well. 
So local modifications are super simple and super efficient using Zipper. Traversal will take a little bit of time, but probably you can pace the cost. If you think about the Zipper, it's kind of like the file structure. Right? File system, you, it allow, it's a tree. We know it's a tree, but it always allows the going up one level data structure. So you know where you are. You can modify the files locally, and then you go up and down, and, and, and you see all the contents back and forth. So now you are probably pretty sold on this, uh, that functional data structures are amazing. And you know that, peers, who programs in Java most of the time? Java people. Uh, who, who, who does Scala? Three hands. Who does Clojure? I love Clojure. I don't program in that that much anymore, but I love it. It's Lisp. Lisps are amazing. Parentheses are everything. So back to the, so we have the implementations and the libraries that provide functional data structures for uh, other languages. Now we have them in Java as well. My favorite of them is the Java slang. And it is a pretty cool library. They wanted to just initially, they wanted to create a wonderful API, uh, expressive and better than the normal. And then they created a functional collection of uh, library. And it's a cool piece of Java code. It's very interesting. Uh, we are also lucky that in the evening, the last slot, Gregors will talk about Java slang more in detail. Uh, so you're welcome to join and listen to that talk how you can use that to spice up your projects and how to do functional Java maybe better. There are other libraries that give you access to functional collections like P collections and others, but uh, I use mostly Java slang myself. What it does, it gives you the wide set of classes that implement all possible, all mostly reasonable data structures in a functional way. So you would have the lists, the queues, the maps, the priority queues, which is fairly interesting, and then it will give you additional things. So what, it's, what is cool about JavaSlang as well is that they, it comes with a set of benchmarks. They know that performance is a big question in terms of should I use functional data structures or not. So they provide a set of micro benchmarks uh, inside the repository and they run it all the time to ensure that they don't have much regressions. Basically what they do, they compare a number of implementation of different collections and say if you are interested in the priority queue uh, in particular, because it's a very cool data structure, uh, you will have, you, they will compare those implementations and you will see some results and you can run it and see if you would like to run it. So. It all, the benchmarks are written using the Java Micro Benchmark Harness, so it kind of gives hope that those benchmarks are not uh, just random numbers. And you can, uh, you can look at that. Say the code for the benchmarks would be something like this. So uh, if you want to see how much time the enqueuing elements will take, uh, just wanted to illustrate how they do the benchmarks for the collections. They just take the empty one and append enqueue elements until it's full for a certain number of operations. They do the DQ in the same way. They just take the full queue and just call the operations until it's empty, which kind of mirrors the normal collections for the queues or other data structures. They have also a more complicated data structure uh, benchmarks like sorting uh, data with the priority queue. So basically you fill it with numbers and then you take them numbers out. And since it's a priority queue, it will come in order. And when the, you run, you will get a result like something like this. So there will be the ratios, not the ratios. Yeah, there will be the report that says the ratio between the implementation of, say, Java slang, persistent collections, and Java mutable collections, or blocking uh, collections. And the results are, and here I don't want to point fingers or say this is good result, or this is bad result, or this is the way it is. So safe harbor statement applies here. Uh, but in general, when you look at those numbers and you run the benchmarks, you will see that Java slang collections, or I run the priority queue benchmarks just this morning, it's a little bit slower than the mutable blocking uh, priority queue. It's a little bit slower than the mutable version of the Scala priority queue. So quite faster than the persistent version of the collection 
of the priority in Scala Z. Don't know what they do in Scala Z, but the, the results that I got were a little bit like this. So you know that you will pay the penal performance penalty if you use functional data structures. And this is just priority queue, so you cannot just say that, oh, Java Slang is two times slower than Java, because that doesn't make sense. Uh, but you kind of get an estimation of what would be the performance penalty for that. And what you can do next, you can just experiment and look at the data and try to maybe use that in your code and then run your own benchmarks and your own software to see if that makes the performance penalty uh, better or worse for you. And you will also see if you would like to work with collections and data structures in a more functional way. So as I say, the Object-oriented programming makes code easy by encapsulating the moving parts. And with functional programming, you minimize that, and then your code is more reasonable. If you would like to know more about data structures, there is an amazing book called Purely Functional Data Structures by Chris Okosaki. And I think it was released in 98, so quite a little bit of time ago. And then after that, a lot of things has changed. So if you would if you don't like the books and you would like to just go through the internet and get more ideas of what the current state of the functional data structures is, you can check out that Stack Overflow answer. And that is one of the best, the best and the most amazing Stack Overflow answers I've seen in my life. So it talks about what has changed and what has been added to the uh, data structures, functional data structures since that Okasaki book, which is a classic book. So, and it goes, this one goes about different maps, the maps for primitives, uh, finger trees, explains the zippers much more, and links to pages, article, blog posts, and implementations of all kinds of purely functional data structures. So, I hope this was interesting. I hope that we looked under the hood of how some functional collections could be implemented. Uh, what I want you to take away from this is that you can be immutable and you can be persistent and still you can have a decent performance uh, and readable code. So, thank you. I think we have exactly three minutes for questions. Ah, no questions. Great. Uh, then I think we have lunch in this during this break. Please, somebody correct me if we don't. <laughs> so, uh, bon appetit.